Welcome back. It is the first book in a duology that I have been meaning to get to. Talk about tackling your TBR. <sighs> that said, I didn't love it as much as I thought I would. It wasn't a bad book, but I found it very difficult to connect with the main character, Kehlani. Sorry, there is an artist named Kehlani, who, and every time I would hear the main character's name, Kanani, I thought Kehlani. Listening to these names, it was hard to keep track, not even just character names, but even place names, they were all very similar. So please excuse me if I get things wrong. I will try to get them right and I might have to correct them in my editing. What happens is, and this is this is dust jacket for you, there is this ritual, this rite of passage that takes place within her country. When the old king is dying, there are a few maidens who are chosen to go with him to the afterlife and Kanani's sister Nenea is one of those and she does not want this to happen. So she does whatever she can to try to save the Lugal from dying so that her sister will not die with him. Why is this important? One, I don't know why she would want to save her sister because they don't seem to get along that well. And if I had this kind of relationship with my sister, I would be like, see you later, have fun in the afterlife. And the thing about Kanani though, is that she doesn't see this as something to be honored. She does not think that going and dying is something that these girls should be put through, that it's not an honor. That's why she's trying to save her sister essentially, is that her sister is under the impression that, wow, you know, I'm gonna be doing this great thing where Kanani's like, you're dying. Like they're gonna kill you. But that's what it's coming down to. Why do you wanna do that? I don't want you to do that. And the bigger issue in why she wants to save her is because Nenea is really all she has left. Their family had been well off and her father had been the best Azu or healer in the realm until he was unable to save the Lugal's son. And then the Lugal is so angry that he strips the family of their wealth and their titles and he sends them to the slums and they're barely making it. Because of this, when her mother is giving birth, nobody is there to help and she ends up dying. Now, mom is gone, they've lost everything and then the dad dies because the, this is something that I had an issue with. When we learn that the Lugal is dying and they're going to choose the sacred maidens and Nanani is chosen, Kanani is like, oh my gosh, I can, no, not at all. I know what can be done. My dad, who's an alcoholic and doesn't do his job, I do it for him. He's gonna go save the Lugal. I honestly thought she would jump to herself before she jumped to her dad because she's doing her dad's job for him all he does is drink all day so i do not see why she thought that he would clean himself up or even have the capability to go save the lugal and, and then her brother kasha i think that's his name kasha because kanani's dad could not save the lugal's son another thing he does is he takes their son and he takes him to the palace. He's kind of rearing him up as the crier's assistant. She gets him and she's like, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the palace and spread this message that the Azu can save the Lugal. And he's like, I'm not gonna do that. So then her love interest, Dagon, who is my favorite, I think he's such a great character. He's still a nobility and he has some sway. So he goes to the palace and he puts word out. They get word that the Nin, who is the Lugal's daughter, Nin Arwia, she wants the Azu to come save her father. We learn very soon after that he is murdered in rout. And then this is when Kainani is brought in because if he can't do it, then she can as his apprentice. So she essentially is spending the whole book trying to save the Lugal, which I have an issue with. She actually doesn't spend the whole book trying to save the Lugal. So I like it, but I don't like it. I, I like the fact that as soon as she gets to the palace, she is being distracted from her duty because it creates tension. We're like, dude, you, you need to save him. Why can't you save him? Why don't you let her save him? But at the same time, 
why is she there if they're not letting her do her job? What's happening is because he is dying and they have the sacred maidens who have also been brought to the palace. They're having all these festivities and all this stuff to honor them and to prepare for the day that the Lugal dies and they're all gonna go to the afterlife. She's constantly being forced to participate in these activities. Ergo, she cannot go hang out with Lugal and save him. Here's a little side thing. I thought that there was gonna be a little bit of magic in this book. That it wasn't going to be straight up, oh, I just know how to use herbs and remedies to save people. I thought when her dad was the best Azu in the land, it's because he had powers and capabilities that nobody else had. And that she, as his apprentice, as somebody who could be equally as good, was going to have those same capabilities. But in actuality, it's being a doctor, essentially. Not having any special skill set except knowledge of plants and how to suture and do things that a doctor does. So I was a little let down that there wasn't something particularly special about Kanani. What she does learn is that the Lugal is being poisoned. Now she's on the road to who is trying to poison the Lugal? What can I do to save him? This is also where some of my disconnect came in because I didn't think she was particularly astute going into the book and knowing something nefarious was at hand, which yes, I know I use the word nefarious a lot. It's one of my other favorite words. So sue me. So I think going into it, knowing that there was something else going on behind the scenes, I was already naturally suspicious. But I expected Kanani to have a similar suspicious mind. And she was pretty clueless throughout the entire book. Even when she found the flower in the Lugal's room, I expected her to know what it meant. Like for me, I was already saying, that's it. That's the answer. That's how he's being poisoned or whatever. That's how they're killing him. And she's just like, oh, this flower, I'm going to throw it in the fire. Actually, I don't think she threw it in the fire. No, maybe she did. She, she second guessed what she was going to do with it. And then I think ultimately, yeah, she threw it in the fire. And then she later, when she realized the significance of it, she's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Because now I have no evidence. It's not until she goes to Dagon's mother, who also is something of a healer. She works more with animals. But it's not until she goes to Dagon's mother and is talking things out that Dagon's mother is like, it kind of sounds like he's being poisoned. Kanani is like, hmm, what do you think that he could be poisoned with? And then what would that look like? And the mother's like, oh, this certain flower. And Kanani's like, oh my gosh, you know? I just expected a little bit more from her. I, I expected her to use her cleverness, her wit, her mental acuity to catch on to something bad happening. We go along and we're sort of being led to believe that it's the Nin who is killing her father. Yes, I liked and then I didn't like. I liked that we, we, we weren't quite sure because the Nin seemed to be sincere in everything she did and said. But at the same time, the thing she was doing and saying could also look like she was intentionally preventing Kainani from healing her father. We get to this point where Kainani breaks into the Nin's bedchamber and is snooping around. She finds this chest and inside the chest are love letters, a lock of hair, and I think there's one more thing in there. Automatically, she jumps to this conclusion that what the Nin is doing is killing off her family members so she can be ruler. How did you jump to that conclusion? My conclusion was these love letters were actually between her and somebody else. And this lock of hair that we're assuming came from a baby, like her, her infant brother, like a second infant brother was actually her own infant. And so this is the deep, dark secret that she is harboring is that she had a child out of wedlock. What we come to find out, because she had made, Nin had made a comment about how she had lost everybody she'd ever loved. And so this is again, what's got my mind turning is I'm like, maybe this person that got her pregnant was someone she wasn't allowed to be with. What it turns out is her brother had died and then her mother had died after giving birth to a baby that had died. 
And now her dad was dying. Not to make light of any of this loss, but it kind of came out of nowhere as this being the thing that affects the nin the most. I thought it would be something a bit deeper and darker and heavier, like a real secret. And I don't understand why the fact that the mother had had another baby boy who had died was a secret. I, I, I didn't see why that was such a big issue for this book. Because it didn't go anywhere. It wasn't the nin. It was actually her lady's maid as well as this guy named N.C. Aruku. Essentially, the Lugal has advisors. And his top advisor had teamed up with the nin's ladies made to kill the Lugal. We're never given a positive reason for why. If it was Roku influencing the maid, which I, I can't remember her name right now. If because of something that had happened in her past, which I'll get to, she was kind of in it with him. And, and so what it was, was Kanani's dad was the Azu woman's family had gotten caught up in a house fire killed everybody and he was unable to save them she had tried to go in and save them and she couldn't but she was left extremely scarred and disfigured and then never seen again somehow she found herself in the service of the Lugal taking care of Nin Arwia but she's harboring a grudge against Anani's dad for not being able to save her family. And this is when it goes back to, he was just a man. He didn't have special powers. So why are they expecting him to do such great things? These people were trapped in a burning house. The Lugal son fell off of a wall. Why do they think that he can save people who are essentially already dead when he gets to them? It was a little outlandish that this expectation was being placed on Kanani and her father to do things just because they're the town healers. I mean, sure, you can be really good at your job. You can be more aware, like you can see things better and more rational so you can figure things out better than maybe somebody else. But I do not know what made them so special as, as Azus. I, I really didn't. They had been poisoning the Lugal. But we don't know this until the very, very end. That, for me, was a problem. I know we had war maidens to follow it up and to further develop them and their plans and all the things that they're doing. But as per this book, I wanted more of that mystery and I wanted more of Kanani figuring things out and blaming people and trying to get to the bottom of it. Instead, what she does is she once again breaks into the Nin's bedroom because she is convinced that it is the Nin who is trying to kill her father. She ransacks it until she finds a brooch. Tucked between the brooch and the backing is more of this poisonous flower. And so she's like, this is my evidence. I knew it. I knew it. She publicly accuses the Nin. And I thought this was a little bit ridiculous. She publicly accuses the Nin. At which point, the Lugal is still alive. And I'm going to backtrack a little just to say, Kanani had been thrown out of a window. And so while she was healing at Dagon's farm, his mother had come to look after the Lugal. And at this point, they figured out what had been poisoning him and they knew the remedy and they were taking care of him. As we know, he's getting better. I have no clue what happened in like the day from which we last hear about how well he's doing to this public forum in which they're going to celebrate the sacred maidens where the Lugal is there and he is on his deathbed once again. I'm like, if Dagon's mom is so competent, how did she not see that he was being poisoned again? Or like, what's going on here? Because you get the strong indication that he was being re-poisoned, which is why he had declined so fast again. Did I miss something here? She gets up on this platform because she's like, I need the Lugal to hear it, to witness what I'm about to say. And so she accuses the Nin. The Lugal dies. Then there's this shift. All of a sudden, Nin Arwia, and she's like, oh, now you 
I'm going to put you under arrest for treason. I, I didn't understand why anybody would listen to Kanani. Because sure, she's the Azu and she's healing the Lugal. But she's an outcast from society. Nobody trusts her. So why are they going to listen to her when she accuses the Nin of killing her dad? All of a sudden, they're going to listen to the Nin, who this is a very male-centric society. That was my probably my favorite aspect of this entire novel was the commentary on how women meant nothing. Women had no voice. Men could do whatever they wanted. They don't respect the Nin because she's a woman. And now that the Lugal is dead, she's in charge. Yet, all of a sudden, they're going to listen to her, even though sec or minutes before, she'd been under arrest for attempting to murder her own father. And then she comes to visit Kanani in jail. And she witnesses Enciroku molesting Kanani. I love that she finally steps up and is like, get out of here. But as she's talking to Kanani, there's no, I mean, there's anger there. But honestly, she's just accepting everything so readily. For me, I would have been yelling. If I'm innocent, I would have been yelling at this person who character assassinated me in front of the entire town. I'm like, uh, not only because it wasn't true, but because how embarrassing it was. I would have just gone after her. And she's just so calm and understanding. And she's like, what I am going to do to punish you is I'm going to make you a sacred maiden too. Which is basically Kanani's worst fear. So it's actually a really good punishment. And then Kanani and the other sacred maidens as Lugal has died are on their way to the tomb. We learn that the Nin is going to join them because apparently the loss of her dad means she can't go on. She has nothing left, no one left. And this is what leads into the next book. I didn't understand this part because uh, again, I was like, are, is she under a spell? Like has, is Ensi Roku some kind of wicked magician, sorcerer? And he's put the Nin under a spell so that she believes she needs to sacrifice herself. She needs to go into this tube as well. Plus the guard who I, I have an issue with him. At first I thought he was going to be a romantic rival. And I was really, really glad when he wasn't because I had issues with the romantic subplot. But guys, the audiobook. It's not that it was bad. I think for one, the narrator was a little old to be doing the narration. Like her voice did not match up with the youthfulness of Kanani. But her male voices, Dagon wasn't so bad, but everybody else, they sounded like buffoons. So this guard probably wasn't a buffoon if I had read him in my own head, but listening to him in someone's interpretation of what he sounds like, it was just too much. On top of the fact that his allegiance, I couldn't figure out who he was aligned with. You'd think that he was all for the Lugal, but then he's like, okay, yeah, um, Kanani, I'll help you break into the Nin's room. And then, oh, well, now that the Nin is in charge, well, now I'm at her mercy. And, oh, well, actually, now that the Nin is going to walk to her death, I, I, I'm just going to do whatever Enciroku says because he's threatening my family. This is really what Kuhn is trying to say was his motivation in the end for going along and sacrificing himself because there's always a guard that has to come along with this procession and will also sacrifice himself to kind of lead the sacred maidens into the afterlife. He, th this is supposed to be his ultimate motivation was to save his family. But we've got nothing about his family before now. They have not been key players in anything he's done. Obviously family is family, but because I had no idea where he was coming from, I thought it was a bit of a stretch to them. You're like, well, I mean, I'm going to kill all you girls plus the Nin plus myself because he's threatening my family if I don't. It, it came out of nowhere. I had an issue connecting with Kanani because I didn't feel like she was all that smart or capable.
I didn't see why she was so important. Why she, and, and this is more of a problem with the next book. I was like, why are you the person to save everybody? You're just an Azu. Not even an Azu. You were an Azu's apprentice until your dad was murdered. And if you haven't guessed, her dad was murdered by N.C. Oroku because he would have known right off the bat that the Lugal was being poisoned. So they're like, we gotta get rid of him before we can get here. I had a lot of character problems. I thought there was a lot of lack of development. And then even with the plot and the subplot, I want Kanani to do her job because that is the whole point of her being here. And I wanna see her following these trails because she's the Azu. That's her, her responsibility in saving the Lugal is figuring out who's trying to kill him and then how to counteract that. And then we have the Nin who just all of a sudden is like, I'm gonna die too. She and then the soldier who I can't remember his name for the life of me right now, they seem to be in something of a trance, which was when at first I thought maybe Oroku was some kind of sorcerer. And it was really just them ignoring Kanani when she's trying to get their attention. I was like, okay. But then on top of all of this, in a land that doesn't have magic, but believes in its gods, I thought it was a really big stretch to then have the boatman, who is a character throughout this entire novel. We open up with Kanani telling a little boy that she is caring for about the boatman, about how when you die, the boatman takes you to the afterlife and how the boatman's not coming yet. We are all about the boatman, saving people from the boatman. And we're getting bits and pieces about Hey, who was the boatman? And then all of a sudden at the end of this very realistic book, the boatman appears inside the tomb and takes the Lugal with him. Uh, that feels very out of character for this book that the, we've, we now have a supernatural element. Mm, I, mm, I'm trying to figure out if I would recommend Grave Maidens. Before I actually get into that, I, I, I need to talk about the romance. This is a very male-centric society, and it's all about men having the power, and they own the women. Kainani, even though she has been cast out of high society for X number of years, Dagon is still in love with her, and he still wants to marry her, even though she is below his station. So I sort of had issues with that because I wanted a little bit more realism in terms of him struggling with his feelings. I don't mind that he actually loves her for her despite the fact that he's not allowed to love her. But I, I wanted to see the struggle of, I love this person, but I'm not allowed to love this person. Yet, Kanani, the entire novel is pushing him away because she doesn't want to be ruled by a man which I like, I liked this idea of her independence, of her knowing her own worth. And it's not so much that she doesn't want to be with Dagon, she just doesn't want to have to give herself up to be his wife because once she gets married, he's in charge of her. When they're married, she has to have kids and she has to give up her ambitions. I wanted more from her in terms of why she was so set against him. It was very heavily implied that she loved him and she was just fighting her feelings. But then the way it was executed, I just wanted her to be like, I do love you, but this is why I can't do it. No, instead of just continually pushing him away and then getting jealous when he's seen with other women, her actions and her reasons fought each other, which is when I was super glad when the other soldier was not brought in as a love interest because I was like, I'm struggling enough with whatever's going on with Kanani and Dagon. And then to bring this other guy in as maybe a temptation for her, it would have been too much. I'd love to know what you guys think. I can't wait to get into War Maidens. I will see you soon. Bye.